Okay, I think we'll go ahead and, and begin. Some people will uh, gradually make their way uh, into the webinar as we, oops, I just clicked on something. I think I'm still here. Yes, I am okay. <laughs> um, welcome again to, uh, to our, our webinar today. We're delighted to have, um, to have um, Masha Shinkarienko uh, here visiting us. She's been visiting U of T as a pre-doctoral fellow for the Yatsik program um, at, the, at uh, the Center for European, Russian, Eurasian Studies, the Monk School uh, since, when was it? January, right? Since January, Masha's been here. And of course, um, you know, we're all more than aware of what's been happening. And of course, this has deep effects on, on Masha personally, but also on, uh, on her research. So I'm sure that that conversation about, the, about Russia's war on Ukraine will enter into the conversation. But the bulk of Masha's research um, uh, has been on the Crimean Tatars. And as, as you'll know, the topic of today's talk is in search of identity, how the Crimean Tatars became indigenous peoples of Crimea. And this research was conducted, of course, before the war. And so Masha has been doing work in this crucially important area on a really understudied topic um, for, uh, for years now. And we look forward to, to her research. Just a little bit more, um, about Masha. She's a PhD candidate in the, in the politics department at the New School in New York City, and her dissertation explores the instrument, instrumentalization of collective identities as tactics of resistance in the Crimean Tatars movement for self-determination. Um, she is a, a Helen Darkovich Memorial Doctoral Fellow at the University of Alberta, also has been a visiting scholar at the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia at NYU. She recently published a terrific article in um, Communist and Post-Communist Studies, um, Compliant Subjects, question mark, how the Tatars in Crimea resist Russian occupation. And so we've been trying to schedule this because we've had Masha here again, as I mentioned, since January. And it's just, it's great to finally um, sit down with you, as it were, in this virtual uh, room to learn about your research. Masha, over to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Ed, for the introduction. And it's such an honor to be presenting my work at Sirius. And thank you, everyone, for coming. I know that the last uh, several months have been really tough for everyone, and we all <laughs> at least ha have the Zoom fatigue from all the events, so I really appreciate um, your interest. So I'm going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, can everyone see the presentation? Okay, perfect. So uh, as Ed was saying, this presentation today is part of a larger project in which I explore how the Crimean Tatars have been using their various identities as tactics and capital in the movement for self-determination. So indigenous identity is only one uh, aspect of uh, my overall general project. So just to give a little bit of a background, the Crimean Tatar movement for self-determination emerged in the early 20th century. At the moment, as we all know, um, the uh, period where a lot of um, processes in Europe were taking pl place, um, the uh, rise of nationalism and Crimean Tatars were not an exception. Um, that was the period where uh, in a matter of several years, a largely uh, apathetic, traditional, apolitical um, Muslim society has turned into a very cohesive um, political uh, force um, uh, that relied uh, not on local identities, but on a new cohesive identity of Crimean Tatars. Um, so when uh, Ukrainians were declaring uh, the Ukrainian People's Republic Crimean, in Kyiv, uh, Crimean Tatars were declaring the Crimean Democratic Republic in uh, Crimea in 1917. Uh, that, of course, wasn't very successful. And in a matter of few months, it was overthrown. And then in the next few years, it was captured and recaptured. And finally, Bolsheviks have managed to, to capture Crimea. So, um, during the Soviet times, Crimean Tatars uh, in the early 20s were for the first time recognized as the indigenous people or Karinoi Narod. Uh, 
um, that uh, designator was not meant in a sense of belonging, but in a sense of development. Crimean Tatars, as many other um, uh, as many other uh, nation minorities or nations, were seen as underdeveloped, backward, and in need of uh, help from the Soviet government to get to that stage of the uh, of the final development of nationhood, and finally to the uh, to become the Soviet proletariat class. So as a result of Lenin's policies of nationalities, uh, Crimea obtained the status of Autonomous Soviet Socialist Republic in 1921 uh, and Crimean Tatars became the titular nation. Um, that, uh, uh, with all the privileges that entailed, uh, that kind of golden age period didn't last long and in 1944 Crimean Tatars were accused of Nazi collaboration and deported to Central Asia. After that, they had 40 years of nonviolent movement to return to Crimea. When the Soviet Union collapsed in the early 90s, they did return to Crimea. They established their own self-governing bodies, Mejlis and Kurultai, and they issued a declaration of national sovereignty in 1991. So uh, when I was studying that uh, period, what struck me is that uh, I rarely came across the term indigenous people uh, since uh, in the post-war period. So after they were deported and they started the movement. Uh, they, uh, in, you know, in the early uh, Soviet period, they clearly benefited from that designator. It was uh, really, uh, they used it to demand more rights, more privileges, more resources, but it lost any meaning after the deportation. So what we see in a post-war era is that the demands for return and self-determination were largely framed through the loyal Soviet citizen identity. So in letters, petitions, in meetings, we see that Crimean Tatars were really trying hard to prove their loyalty to the Soviet state, to dispel that label of collaborators and traitors, and to show that they pose no threat to the Soviet regime and that they should be allowed to return back. So we don't see anywhere the, any mention of indigenous people. However, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the, when the Crimean Tatars finally returned to their homeland and issued um, this national, the documents of the Declaration of National Sovereignty, this is where they start using the term again. So in the very early 90s. So the Declaration of National Sovereignty declares Crimea as the national territory of the Crimean Tatar people on which only they have the right for self-determination, despite them uh, being a very tiny minority. The uh, Crimea was already um, repopulated with the um, population from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, they have also issued a project of the constitution um, uh, of Crimean Republic that they were hoping to, to uh, establish in which they recognize themselves as indigenous people. So that new designator completely uh, kind of overshadowed that identity of the Soviet citizen that we see previously. So since then, for two decades now, Crimean Tatars have been invoking their indigeneity as a basis for official recognition, for political representation, to legalize the, the land squatted, um, to access state resources. They were also involved very actively in the global indigenous movement and participated in the indigenous people's forums in Geneva, New York. Um, finally, in 2021, President Zelensky signed the law that recognized Crimean Tatars as indigenous people. Um, so how, my question is, how did this uh, jump happen? Why Crimean Tatars choose to uh, identify themselves uh, as indigenous people? Why use this framework? Um, why, uh, especially uh, that, that uh, choice was not very self-evident given that the, the rhetoric in the early 90s was very ethnonationalist and uh, how do you combine the uh, kind of the, the nationalist rhetoric or claims uh, to, with indigenous uh, rhetoric? So these are usually very different, but somehow they combine them and 
Um, my question is why indigenous people and not ethnic minorities or uh, national minorities? So through my research, I came with four explanations. Um, one is that the, the um, concerns the role of the modern state in shaping identities through policies of inclusion and exclusion. Another explanation concerns the, the emergence of the revisionist popular history uh, that um, tried to uh, establish Crimean Tatars to prove the, uh, uh, the, their indigeneity. Another explanation concerns the similarities in economic conditions and political marginalization of indigenous people around the world with which Crimean Tatars could identify. Finally, this was all happening, of course, in a broader context of the rise and victories of the global indigenous movement. So now I'm going to uh, kind of um, give a little bit uh, to explain every one of these arguments. So we all know that the modern states are very important if, uh, in uh, um, how their, uh, their populations um, uh, live in, through politics and economy and, of course, how they see themselves. Um, so both uh, all of those states, USSR, Ukraine and now Russia, have been um, deliberately or not establishing boundaries that separated Crimean Tatars from the others, physically, economically and politically. So as I was already mentioning, uh, the Soviet Union first included and then excluded Crimean Tatars from polity through nationalities policies and then deportation. Uh, despite Crimean Tatars being only a quarter of the population in the early Soviet period, uh, they in fact were um, recognized as a titular nation in Crimea, which uh, gave them all kinds of um, benefits and privileges that was followed with the policies of Tatarizatsia, which uh, promoted Crimean Tatars uh, for political offices, bureaucracy, the distribution, influenced the distribution of land. Uh, Crimean Tatar language was recognized as one of the official languages. Culture was uh, thriving with state subsidies. Um, after that, then the, we see the, 90, the 30s, the, it was the period of the purchase of bourgeois nationalism, which kind of culminated in the 1944 deportation. So we see very drastically how Crimean Tatars were first elevated to that um, kind of privilege, privilege position and then uh, dropped to the bottom with uh, complete non-recognition. Even the name Crimean Tatars was not used at all. Uh, they were uh, prevented from returning to Crimea. Those who tried to return were report, re repeatedly deported. They were denied the work authorization and residency permits in Crimea. So after the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, Ukraine rule didn't really change, um, challenge the Crimean Tatars exclusion. Legally, Crimea was part of Ukrainian uh, Soviet Republic since 1954, but demographically it was already dominated by the Russian and kind of pro-Soviet population who settled after the deportation. So where, while in the early 90s in Crimea, or in all over Ukraine, there was this democratic fervor and uh, uh, the spirit of liberalism and freedom in Crimea, it was still very conservative. The communist elite still ruled. Uh, the pro-Russian uh, uh, views uh, were still uh, there. Um, and in addition, um, uh, whereas in the Soviet Union, there was one center that um, Crimean Tatars were kind of uh, had to interact with, it was in Moscow. Now, after the collapse, there were two centers. One was in Kyiv, the central government, and one was in Crimea itself. Um, Crimea was recognized as autonomous republic, which uh, they had their own parliament uh, and so on. So um, there was that uh, actually Im Im impacted very much how Cr uh, Crimean Tatars were interacting. There were always these tensions between them and the Crimean government and Ukrainian government, between Ukrainian and Crimean government. So there were lots of tensions. Um, so one of the, I guess I will just uh, describe 
uh, some of the tensions that were uh, in those uh, in the 90s and uh, 2000s in Crimea. So one was the uh, tension regarding the future of Crimea, whether uh, the uh, Crimean uh, politicians, that uh, kind of old guard elite, they wanted to re reproach with Russia. There were lots of uh, separatists, especially in the early 90s. They argued for the restoration of Crimean Autonomous Republic. And Crimean Tatars boycotted that. They thought that that doesn't include their interests and doesn't include their voice. At the same time, uh, Crimean Tatars were in a very hard, uh, difficult economic uh, situation. Um, that you can see uh, from this slide uh, just how, uh, how bad their uh, material situation was, the unemployment, the lack of citizenship that was a, a problem for some time, the lack of political representation. So they were uh, pretty much excluded from uh, every sphere. Uh, in Crimea. Um, and when while they were uh, explaining that with the uh, kind of ethnic discrimination and the deliberate policies of exclusion, Crimean authorities denied that and uh, were uh, kind of using this argument that uh, of individual responsibility. Uh, at the same time, uh, the Crimean authorities were uh, propagating the Crimean regional identity that sought, kind of sought to gloss over the ethnic distinctions and conflicting history. And um, as you can see here, Crimean identity was mostly uh, synonymous with Russian ethnic identity, and uh, it was uh, supported with those myths that of Crimea as the Russian land, that it was the place of Russian orthodoxy, the myth of Sevastopol as the city of the Russian glory. Um, and 65.4% of the Slavic community actually identified with those, uh, with, with that uh, regional identity. And for them, it meant Russian language, positive attitude towards Russia, the negative attitudes towards NATO, and so on. So in this narrative, there was really no place for Crimean Tatars apart from being the usual other, uh, because since the imperial times in the, in, in the historiography and uh, in the popular discourse through the Soviet Union and in the 90s, Crimean Tatars were always portrayed as unreliable, as traitors, as pillagers, as barbarians, and the everyday racism was also uh, kind of reinforced by the local government and by this um, kind of ideas of the regional uh, uh, Crimean regional identity. So from this, from the very inception, this mythology was entirely foreign and colonizing, and the whole uh, pretense of multiculturalism just seemed very artificial, and it concealed the power disbalance and the history of colonization. So uh, Crimean, it's not actually surprising that in response to that, Crimean Tatars have invoked the frame of indigenous people to challenge that Russian uh, claims to the, to the land and the whole history of Crimea being Russian land. Um, it's uh, uh, important to know that uh, the first annexation of Crimea happened in 1783. And before there were uh, Crimean Tatars had their own statehood, Crimean Khanate. So describing themselves as indigenous, Crimean Tatars uh, rejected those stereotypes of the um, Tatar Mongol horde, barbarians, and uh, also rejected that uh, uh, kind of pretense of the harmonious ethnic coexistence, which was not true on a, in a daily life. Um, so that was uh, what was happening in Crimea and Ukrainian central government didn't really pay attention to that in all those um, and 24 years. Uh, they worried that if they give Crimean Tatars the status of indigenous people, um, then that will open the Pandora box uh, for other ethnic claims and other uh, ethnic minorities would want, um, would want also that status. Uh, they also didn't really believe like the Crimean establishment that they had an actual collective responsibility for the, uh, to assist Crimean Tatars in their repatriation. That was the Soviet Union that deported them and it's not our business. 
Uh, and of course, the usual culprits, the passivity, corruption, inconsistency. Uh, Ukraine actually didn't really have a, a strategic vision of the of um, Ukraine developments and role of Crimea uh, in it. Unfortunately, after the annexation, things got much worse for Crimean Tatars in Crimea. Uh, during the first years, several prominent Crimean Tatar leaders uh, were banned from entering Crimea. Majlis and Kurultai, the self-governing bodies, were, were banned as extremist organizations. Uh, a lot of people are in jail for the trumped-up charges of terrorists and extremists. Um, on the other hand, Ukrainian government recognized finally the leverage Crimean Tatar po possessed in the legal dispute over Crimea. Um, they understood that recognizing Crimean Tatars as indigenous people would actually aid uh, weight to the Ukraine's legal claims to Crimea and will harness the support for Ukraine's territorial integrity because Crimean Tatars were very pro-Ukrainian. Um, the on, mostly the only pro-Ukrainian force in Crimea. And for that reason, uh, in 2014 alone, uh, Ukrainian government actually did more than they did in the previous 23 years. So you can see here there are some actual uh, real achievements, there are symbolic gestures. Uh, Ukraine finally, um, finally joined the UN DREAP Charter. They finally adopted the law on the indigenous people just last year. And then there are a lot of um, uh, just symbolic gestures as renaming the airport in or, uh, honor of uh, Crimean Tatar famous pilot Ahmed Han Sultan. So here I was trying to kind of demonstrate that the, the role of the modern state in fostering Crimean Tatar's collective identity through policies of inclusion and exclusion. And now I would like to turn to my next uh, argument or explanation. Um, to kind of further explain um, the choice of, an, uh, of indigeneity. So uh, this is uh, Valery Vazgrin, a Russian historian. Uh, his lifelong work on conceptualization of Crimean Tatars as indigenous people had a really profound impact on Crimean Tatars. It also offered a new conceptual framework to frame their grievances and new uh, outlets to channel them. Um, it was the first, so it is due to him actually that Crimean Tatars started to uh, see themselves and identify themselves as indigenous people, uh, that the Crimean Tatar leadership adopted indigeneity as a kind of predominant frame of uh, mobilization. Uh, since no no other channels inside Ukraine could uh, could help them achieve their uh, their demands, um, and they also found a platform uh, where they could you know channel those grievances. So uh, what's interesting about Valery Vazgrin is that he was born uh, just a few years before deportation. So he was a child when he uh, witnessed how how uh, quickly and drastically Crimea, uh, Crimea was uh, changed and russified. Uh, he witnessed the deportation. He um, later became a historian, uh, but he, Crimea kind of has always been on his mind and he, he thought it was his lifetime goal to, um, to uh, um, uh, I'm quoting, to cleanse Crimean history from the layers of lies and dirt and uh, uh, hand Crimean Tatars their own history, end of quote. Um, so he started publishing in the Soviet Union in Samizdat, where he became, his work became uh, familiar to Crimean Tatars. And uh, in 1992, he published uh, his very famous work, Historical Destinies of Crimean Tatars. He also, he was so popular uh, that he even was, he was the only non-Tatar um, person appointed into the, uh, rep elected into the representative uh, government, which in 1991. Um, he was um, engaged in drafting national documents with the Crimean Tatar leadership. 
He was representing Crimean Tatars at the national international conferences and really is probably the most uh, important Crimean Tatar ally. Um, in 2014, he uh, published his um, work, his four volume uh, history of Crimea that was uh, kind of the, uh, his legacy. He uh, died last year. And that book became a really a, kind of a household necessity in every Crimean Tatar family. Um, so, of course, uh, in Crimea and in Russia, he was um, accused of Russophobia and there were lots of protests against his book. And even in the Crimean parliament, there were sessions that were discussing what to do with him, whether to sue him for Russophobia or uh, 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 fire him from, from the St. Petersburg University where he worked. So what now I'm uh, going to move in towards his, uh, his ideas. Uh, so he used a um, concept of ethnogenesis that was developed by uh, Lev Gumilov. And um, he used that concept to advocate that Crimean Tatars were really indigenous people and not Russian. So that was contrary to every... Uh, uh, every kind of Soviet uh, history book that was written. And so he was going absolutely against uh, the grain. Uh, so the concept of ethnogenesis uh, is a very kind of um, phantasmagoric, very kind of mystic and spiritual um, concept that uh, treats the ethnos as this organic being that evolved over centuries through amalgamation, disintegration with other groups under the influence of geographic factors and some, um, some cosmic forces. And so, you know, uh, Gumilov, I, I don't really have time to go, <laughs> go into Gumilov's here, but um, that whole um, approach to setting ethnicities is uh, obviously not very scientific, not very trustworthy, but um, that, uh, that's uh, actually a very mainstream approach to studying ethnicities in the post-Soviet space. Um, and he was uh, taking that approach to expand the chronological uh, frames of studying Crimean Tatars and contest um, uh, the myth uh, that Crimean Tatars have uh, emerged only in the 13th century uh, with the advent of the Golden Ord. And so he, uh, he argued that actually uh, we should look into history because this is how ethnogenesis works. And uh, if you look down into antiquity, you can trace how that, um, how through all these amalgamations and disintegrations, this refined Crimean Tatars that we see today have emerged. Um, and um, yeah, so that already kind of makes them indigenous people because they were here from the very antiquity, even though it was not uh, yet that uh, established ethnos, as he was saying. Another very important and very interesting uh, idea is that is this idea of ethnopsychological makeup of the people that is formed through ethnogenesis and also explains who is a colonizer and who is not, who was the first in Crimea and who was not. And in this account, he is um, uh, spending a lot of chapters trying to understand how Crimean Tatars evolved morally and spiritually and how Russians have evolved. So he describes Crimean Tatars as people with the highest sense of dignity, extraordinarily tolerant, very open-minded. And he says that these traits have developed through the process of ethnogenesis. Um, the positive moral qualities have been passing from the generation to generation that allowed them to refine this Crimean religion tolerance and actually survive. And he was following Gumilov saying that an uh, island psychology is another contributing uh, factor that made them more uh, open, democratic, sensitive to diversity, and so on. On the other hand, Russians were portrayed as inherently uh, intolerant, uh, chauvinistic, uh, 
uh, and close-minded and uh, he calls them the mirror antipods to Crimean Tatars and that this polar incompatibility in that in the in this uh, ethnopsychological makeup uh, is at the root of all the negative processes in the history of the Crimean Tatars. So he was kind of using this um, uh, prescriptions of uh, psychological and moral qualities to entire nations and saying that this is why Crimean Tatars are uh, victims and Russians are colonizers and uh, also uh, making the moral argument for who can claim uh, Crimea as their homeland. And this um, kind of these ideas uh, are really hard to overestimate because they took a very deep um, roots in how Crimean Tatars see themselves today and they see themselves exactly through these binaries that characterize uh, that uh, characterizing themselves and their right to claim uh, Crimea. So I always heard in my ethnographic fieldwork these invocations of the inherent traits of tolerance, hospitality, decency, love and care for Crimea as an explanation of why they and not Russians should uh, have more rights to Crimea. Uh, at the same time, the, his work also shaped a lot the, um, the direction in which the histor uh, Crimean uh, historical scholarship uh, went in the region. There is really hardly any scholar that doesn't uh, cite um, Vazgrin and even like recently published work uh, in Ukraine. Uh, Crimean Tatar authors, Ukrainian authors, they all use this uh, for, uh, this ideas of ethnogenesis uh, as uh, to combat the, the Soviet stereotypes and vindicate the Crimean Tatars' indigeneity. Okay, so now I'm going to move to my uh, third and fourth explanation, and that is kind of contextualizing Crimean Tatars' choice of indigeneity into the broader uh, global indigenous movement. So when the movement uh, started to emerge in the 60s and 70s, Crimean Tatars uh, did not have access. They were behind the Iron Curtain in the Soviet Union. Uh, they were also much better off than other indigenous uh, people around the globe because of how they were socialized into the, the state, Soviet state economy uh, and the uh, allocation of state resources for their development. The Soviet Union was uh, trying to suppress the national government, prevent Crimean Tatars to return to Crimea, and so they were trying to kind of um, supply them with the resources and opportunities in the areas of exile in Central Asia. So they had a pretty good economic standing. However, when the Soviet Union collapsed, um, that kind of uh, changed completely and Crimean Tatars uh, fell from being this uh, kind of uh, having a good economic standing and uh, um, kind of middle having a middle class lifestyle. They in overnight became really uh, uh, impoverished, landless, stateless. They came to Crimea and everything evaporated, all their savings. And of course, the huge economic crisis in Crimea. So uh, this kind of new economic and social position made them very close to other indigenous uh, groups around the world. Uh, also, the tactics that they were using to address uh, those injustices were also very, very similar to the tactics that, that other groups used. So the massive land squatting campaigns, some of the blockading roads, occupying squares, uh, staging rallies, hunger strikes, they were all very, very similar to how indigenous people in Canada, in the US and Latin America were uh, doing exactly the same things. And uh, of course, the state response was the same. The police brutality, lack of due process, extra legal measures, racism was also a very similar um, in, in relations with the authorities as other indigenous groups. So there were a lot of similarities starting from the 90s. And uh, so Crimean Tatars were 
seeking cooperation within and beyond the post-Soviet space. Um, uh, in contrast to Ukrainians and other their dissident allies, they couldn't, they didn't have the legacy of the ethno-federal structure, so they couldn't argue, uh, argue for the nationhood. Um, and uh, so they were looking for other avenues to address uh, to address the injustices. Um, at the same time, the global indigenous movement was, despite all the uh, predictions, it was actually gaining popularities, were gaining major victories uh, through international organizations and forums such as UN Working Group on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the International Labor Organization, uh, the ILO Convention uh, was adopted in 1980. Uh, 89, and it demonstrated that being identified as indigenous actually carried implications for legal, political, cultural, and economic rights, and in some cases were more potent than other definitions, such as ethnic identity uh, or ethnic minority. And as uh, Courtney Young, uh, the uh, UFT professor, also claimed that indigenous identity became a resource that allowed millions of the world's poorest and most dispossessed to challenge the terms of their exclusion. So Crimean Tatars seeing themselves in this kind of broad definition and seeking help outside of the state chose to, uh, uh, to align themselves with the indigenous movement and call themselves indigenous people uh, and not ethnic minority. Uh, from the early 90s, they found refuge in such organizations as uh, Unrepresented uh, Nations and Peoples Organization, the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples in the UN, the Working Group on Indigenous Populations in Geneva, uh, the adoption of the UN DRIP uh, in 2008 provided the legal definition in which Crimean Tatars could uh, now formally um, identify themselves and also the uh, kind of the sophisticated international legal framework that Ukraine finally signed in 2014. So it became this very uh, kind of necessary tool for the legitimization of identity also among activists. At the same time, the global indigenous movement not only provided the, uh, this uh, avenues, uh, but also helped to change the rhetoric because the uh, colonial situation, as we know, is, is widely recognized as one of the key factors in determining indigeneity. So uh, Mahmoud Mamdani claims that settler and native go together, that there can be no settler without a native and vice versa. And that whole um, uh, discourse was foreign for Crimean Tatars in the Soviet Union, because they were actually, as I was mentioning, um, uh, they were uh, trying to do kind of the opposite. They were trying to become part of the big metropole and they didn't see themselves as colonial subjects. They uh, wanted to uh, get all the um, recognition and resources from, uh, from the empire. Um, but this changed the, um, with the collapse of the Soviet Union. They started, uh, thanks to the global indigenous movement, they actually started to see themselves also as the colonized nation. They, they, uh, even when staging uh, different city, civil disobedience campaigns, they use slogans such as no to colonialism and communist tyranny in Crimea and Ukraine, or uh, Russia colonizer, the horde of Bolsheviks. Um, and while in the, in, among the First Nations in Canada or Native Americans in the US, um, the indigeneity is a historical fact uh, and not a matter of a dispute. This is not the case in Crimea. As I was saying before, the myth of uh, Crimea as the Russian land is pretty potent and being recognized internationally as indigenous people meant for Crimean Tatars not so much as the preservation of the traditional lifestyle, but actually the contestation of the Russian narrative about Crimean history and claims to the territory. One of the things that I found very interesting is that despite the, their uh, kind of uh, uh, really trying to fit into this in global indigenous movement, uh, there was one aspect that uh, was very uh, um, made them kind of incompatible. I'm talking about the ideological incompatibility because indigenous uh, movements are usually characterized by 
their new anti neoliberal agenda, emphasis on spirituality and relation to the land and to the uh, nature, and in general, just challenges entirely the Western model of civilization and progress. And the Crimean Tatars, um, on the contrary, are very pro Western and have been since the 19th century. They have never experienced the actual colonization by the European powers and uh, the industrialization and modernization that began in the, in the, in the 1930s was not associated with, uh, with the advent of capitalism, but with the Soviet state economy. Um, so uh, even uh, when the um, uh, in the when the uh, rampant uh, privatization campaign started in the 90s that completely disadvantaged them uh, from accessing land as opposed to the Russian citizens in Crimea uh, that didn't make them anti-capitalist or anti-neoliberal -ne and uh, also the exploitation of resources in Crimea also didn't make them so for example if the um, kind of extraction of fossil fuel in Crimea is criticized, is criticized not from the point of view of uh, environmental dangers, uh, but from the, uh, from the, they were criticized from the exclusion of Crimean Tatars from the uh, revenue shares. And in the case of privatization, uh, it was not the practice itself that was criticized, but the way it was implemented by the Crimean corrupt elites uh, that uh, intentionally disadvantaged Crimean Tatars. So that was uh, a very kind of important difference um, and uh, I, I thought it was <laughs> uh, pretty interesting. Okay, so I'm going to conclude here and um, uh, just wanted to reiterate that indigenous identity is a really powerful resource of mobilization for Crimean Tatars but it is not the only one. So in other uh, chapters, I describe how uh, they have developed Ukrainian identity and European identity. So indigenous is only one of, of the many, but it is uh, really very important. Um, and as we see, <laughs> it's actually working for them. Um, okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and would love to hear your questions or comments uh, or any ideas that you would like to share. Great, thanks, thanks so much, Masha. Um, and I know, I know you, can't, you can't see too many faces, maybe only just mine, but, um, but so we'll just do this uh, applause. Um, and, and I invite anyone who has a question to put it in to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I see a couple of questions have come in, uh, keep them coming. I have some questions of my own. And, you know, we have uh, potential until until 1.30. Uh, we'll see, you know, I mean, we've been keeping, we've been having you go uh, speak for uh, for 45 minutes. So we, we'll, we'll see what the endurance levels are. There's a, um, a quick question that came right at the beginning when you described the period from I think 21 until the war, until the end of the war as a sort of golden age for Crimean Tatars or a golden period. Um, the, question, the question here is, were the Crimean Tatars not affected by the purges? And you started to get to that a tiny little bit so you, yeah. when you start to discuss the years leading up to the deportation. But, you know, at what point does this actually turn? Because when does golden start to seem not, not all that golden, I guess is the question. Right. Thank you so much for the question. Um, so it was actually lasted only uh, only a decade. It started in the uh, with the um, uh, the Soviet Union, and then just for over uh, a little bit over a decade, the Crimean Tatars were really enjoying this kind of the exuberance of the. Um, the culture and history, and uh, they were really for the first time recognized as uh, legitimate uh, owners of uh, of Crimean legacy. And um, but yes, uh, that didn't last long, and uh, I didn't have time to go through that in the in the paper. But now I'm going to uh, say that in the 30s already uh, the purges started. Yes, and uh, basically all the uh, national uh, they were called, of course, the national bourgeoisie, and they were all eliminated. And uh, that whole long process of um, uh, 
um, really cramping down on all the progress that has been made, um, uh, culminated with the deportation in 1944. Um, and so, yes, it only, it was a very short time, um, but it actually really, uh, I think, influenced how Crimean Tatars uh, developed this, uh, also helped them develop their identity. Yeah, let me, uh, that actually leads to an, another question that was that's sort of brewing in my mind. I'm, I'm thinking about you know as somebody who studies Central Asia, I'm you know think a lot about the, the um, so-called modernizers, the Jadids and and so on um, in Central Asia, and a lot of them actually were, were Crimean Tatar, Volga Tatar, um, and others sort of in that sort of pan-Turkic world. Um, and I, and there was and you alluded kind of interestingly to um, you know how the movement today is not is not anti-capitalist particularly right which is an interesting thing and I wonder if there's, if we can trace any of that lineage to the um, embrace I think you see among Crimean Tatar at least the intelligentsia uh, of sort of some notion of, uh, you know, whatever an early 20th century notion of modernity would have, uh, and of modernization would have been, right? That there's sort of a, in a way, an infatuation, and they became the, the um, in a way, the missionaries, if that's the right word, for this, for some modernizing vision, which initially looked Soviet, but I wonder if the purges yeah. <laughs> didn't, uh, didn't drive a wedge in, in that, but but any any comments on that that sort of link there? Yeah, I think there's definitely a link, and uh, for, uh, uh, like since the 19th century, Crimean Tatars had their own uh, intellectuals. That like Ismail Gasprinsky, who uh, was very pro-Western and uh, uh, kind of yeah, I, uh, I guess the that's kind of fascination with the West and with progress and. Uh, the development and now also the repulsion with the from the Soviet uh, past um, really formed now. Uh, but it's also not only Crimean Tatars, right? Like a lot of <laughs> the vast majority of uh, post-Soviet um, people everywhere, uh, they are not anti-capitalist and not, uh, yeah, it's very different from uh, other indigenous uh, people in Latin America or in the U.S. or uh, anywhere. Yeah. No, that's uh, that's that, that's great. I mean, it feels like there's, in a way, what it means to be indigenous in this part of the world might be a little different. Because I was trying to I was trying to refine, in my sense, the distinction between sort of um, I don't know ethno nationalism um, on the one hand and you know a claim to ind indigeneity on the other. And I guess there's nothing to say that you can't draw from both both discourses but conceptually it just it, at least in this part of the world i think it becomes a, a little a little hard to make that sort of a, 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 a to draw a red line be between yeah. the two oh uh, is that does that make sense to you yeah definitely it's a big paradox that i just i found really fascinating <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. And also that kind of makes it, uh, that makes the whole, the whole question of why indigenous and why not uh, ethnic minority or national minority or nation, like why why not, yeah, I, I guess my whole interest in the topic was kind of spurred from that uh, yeah. really uh, strange paradox. Yeah, um, yeah no, I, I'm, I, I'm sort of thinking in my mind, maybe the discourse that they draw from the groups that are that are um, that are marginalized um, in any given state context draw draw from. And maybe it's a function a little bit of a couple of things that maybe you can comment on. One, I imagine um, just the simple cultural demography, um, you know, and maybe if you can say a little bit about sort of the changing, you know, proportions of of people of peoples of different different uh, call them ethnic groups for uh, uh, for want of a better word over over the years specifically on the Crimean Peninsula and then the other thing and this comes from a question um, uh, from Don Schwartz um, can you comment on the relationship between Crimean Tatars and the, and their diaspora communities because you know in a way I mean Don's not asking this but I'm asking this um, based on his question um, you know the the discourse that you draw from may be a function of well 
who you're connected to, right, um, in the diaspora or, or elsewhere. So can you can you give us a sense of the sort of relationship with the diaspora and also the sort of changing ethnic demography? Yeah, so um, as I, I think I showed in uh, my slides how um, Crimean Tatars have gradually, well, they were returning to Crimea pretty uh, um, en masse, and then that uh, slowed down a little bit, but by... Um, I would say before 2014, there were around 300,000 of Crimean Tatars in Crimea, and um, that was 13% of the population. So Crimea is uh, 2 million people. Now it's more because now Russians are actually uh, colonizing, like a very, uh, very difficult practice. They are bringing Russians uh, to Crimea. And uh, after the annexation, a lot of Crimean Tatars have moved, around 40,000 people moved to mainland Ukraine due to the repressions. Uh, and uh, yes, there is a huge uh, Crimean Tatar diaspora. The biggest one is in Turkey. There are actually around 5 million Crimean Tatars living there. So that's a huge uh, number. But these people, they moved there in the 19... Uh, wait, yeah... Uh, Yes, 19th century after the uh, Crimean War, uh, and um, there were several waves of immigration to Turkey. So they are, it is very hard to say whether they are Turkish or Crimean Tatars. A lot of Crimean Tatars in Crimea think that those who moved to Turkey at that time, that they are not Crimean Tatars anymore. Uh, and um, uh, yes, uh, the in general, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not an expert on the diaspora, Crimean Tatar diaspora, but I know that they are uh, very helpful. Uh, they were in the 90s when Crimean Tatars were um, traveling back to Crimea. And there are good ties uh, in the US with the uh, diaspora in the US, in Toronto, uh, with Crimean Tatars uh, in Crimea and now leadership uh, in Kiev because after 2014, Majlis was banned and uh, almost like a lot of Crimean Tatar leaders had to move to um, to Kiev, to mainland. Um, yeah, that's, that's that's really helpful. There, there are a, a variety of, of questions here. Let me sort of try to weave them together. Um, can you say a little bit about, um, I guess, what makes Crimean Tatars distinctive? Um, to what extent is there um, uh, is the Tatar language being used, uh, for example? Um, is it in the context of multilingualism? How has that shifted sort of uh, over, over the years? And then uh, an, another question I would ask, just adding to the mix, um, what about uh, religious um, I identity, and then I guess a, a, a third question. So so far we've got language, and we've got religion, and then the third question comes from um, Lynn Viola. Uh, it's about maybe it's political, right? Um, what has been the reaction, as far as we can tell, of uh, Crimean Tatars to Russia's war on Ukraine? Yeah, thank you so much. So I'll start with the language. Uh, obviously, during the deportation, uh, Crimean, and I mean, 40 years of exile, Crimean Tatars lost a lot of it, uh, culture and language, they were completely russified, and even the name Crimean Tatars were not used in censor, like in all the censors, they were, uh, censuses, they were, um, called just Tatars, which is a whole, a whole <laughs> just a, a mix of all the different uh, ethnic groups. They don't really have much in common with each other, uh, but uh, they have put a lot of efforts to revive their culture, their language, their religion. They are Muslims, Sunni Muslims. And um, in the 90s, there were a lot of, like that's another tension with the Crimea um, authorities who were trying to, um, to show Crimea as the uh, kind of the cradle of Russian orthodoxy. And there were many, many cases where they would put uh, just kind of establish Russian crosses everywhere, like thousands of crosses. And Crimean Tatars were very upset um, because, of, because of that, like this very symbolic um, uh, kind of uh, 
sign that Crimea is not for Crimean Tatars because uh, a lot of the uh, mosques and uh, uh, all these cultural institutions, they were simply demolished during the Soviet times. And there is only few of them left really in Crimea, in Bakhchisarai, which is the, the, the small uh, city where, which was the residency of the Crimean Khan during the 15th century. There is the palace and there is like, you can actually see that, yes, that was how Crimea looked <laughs> during the medieval times. It doesn't look like this at all now. So uh, the uh, language, they, um, they, they try to speak uh, Crimean Tatar language, but it is mostly the colloquial language. So um, there is very little, uh, um, Yes, like it does, it's not really used as an academic language. It's very hard for people to talk on uh, like big political issues uh, or uh, have like a sophisticated discussion. It is usually just like a home language, but there has been changes and uh, there are a lot of Crimean Tatar patriots who are trying to revive it and um, publish poetry and uh, literature in Crimean Tatar language now. Um, Okay, so regarding the war, yes, of course, Crimean Tatars in, in 2014, they have shown themselves as the, um, the really best organized pro-Ukrainian force in Crimea. They have been protesting and they have been uh, saying for decades to Ukrainian government that Russian that separatism in Crimea is a thing and, and, they, and no one wanted to do anything about it. Everyone actually thought that it was Crimean Tatars, uh, uh, Islam, that will probably at some point will be a problem. But no, it turned out to be the, <laughs> the Russian separatism. And uh, so they were against uh, the Russian invasion from the very beginning. And over this eight years, their life has been miserable in Crimea. Everyone is really frightened and... Um, the level of repression is just staggering. People get 15, 20 years in prison just for having a Ukrainian flag at home or for going to a mosque. Uh, anyone can, yeah, so it, it is really, um, uh, really horrible. And now with the war, uh, they are afraid that they will be deported again. And this is what's already happening to Ukrainians in Mariupol. We know that half a million Ukrainians have already been uh, deported. And now, you know, if a few months ago, uh, I would have thought that that's something that doesn't really happen anymore, um, the deportation. Uh, now that's something in the realm of the possibility. Um, and uh, they were Crimean Tatars in Crimea, they called um, after the 2014, they were saying that um, they are having, uh, what was they called? They said that uh, Russia cannot uh, cleanse Crimea like uh, uh, from us in the 21st century. So they are doing this slow deportation where they basically arresting everyone and uh, those who they don't arrest, they just make uh, uh, everything so that they just would leave by themselves. Uh, and now, uh, now they are actually like people do are afraid that they will be deported in like in 1944. Yeah, I mean the sad tragedy of this, and not to mention the the, the war more generally, is that it's designed to to wipe out identities. And it probably has the opposite effect of, of hardening identities and, and giving people um, a, uh, a, a, sense of, a sense of solidarity and, and historical memory that's hard to erase. I mean, there's nothing quite like, I mean, the memory of deportation, at least of the other peoples who were deported from the Caucasus that I, I've had occasion to, to chat with, uh, is very strong, right? Even if they didn't experience it the directly themselves, yeah. it's a sort of it becomes in a way a foundational, you know, yeah. um, story. I was going to say myth, but that makes that discredits it. It's you know sort of story that undergirds the sense of identity. I think that that's um, um, question. What talk about um, uh, what's his name? Yuri, was it Yuri Mishkov? Uh, 
Oh, the, yeah. The, because there was some degree, even um, under, even before the annexation, right? There was some degree of uh, separatist sentiment um, on the peninsula. So w was it serious? Was it, um, was it unserious? You know, yeah. uh, what, what was it? Yeah, so, um, I mean, Crimea uh, became part of Ukraine after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and it was part of the Ukrainian SSR since 1954, kind of nominally. In practice, the majority were Russian, uh, Russian people there uh, who were uh, uh, resettled in the, in the 40s and 50s. Um, so it, there were lots of discussions ab about, uh, uh, since the collapse, about the future of Crimea, whether it should be within Ukraine, within Russia. No one really were, uh, uh, I mean, conversations about like being part of Russia uh, was not like the most, uh, yeah, was not very um, serious, I would say, um, because, well, at that point, so Mishkov separatism, it was like 1944, uh, he was the, uh, uh, forgot his um, official title, but uh, um, the chairman, I guess, um, of the yeah, Crimean uh, Republic, and he uh, was the uh, um, a very ardent supporter of actually uniting with Russia. But um, Russia at that time was itself; it was only kind of uh, had a, its own problems, its own economic crisis, its own identity crisis, and um, that was just not something feasible, not something that they were interested to do. Yeltsin was definitely not interested to fight with Ukraine over Crimea. Um, so yeah, that uh, Ukraine was actually, uh, they were, um, so Ukrainian central government was um, worried about that. And that's why they allowed Crimea to have their own autonomy to have their own constitution, their own parliament. So there was this uh, kind of uh, appeasement um, uh, tactics that was used to kind of, they were hoping that that would uh, kind of suppress that uh, separatism. And it did uh, disappear for, for some time. Like there were a lot, it was still very pro-Russian. There were still Russian, uh, those Cossack groups and there were lots of Russian influence and money. But there were no real talk of uh, uniting with Russia. Um, yeah. No, that's that's great. I mean, there there are a bunch of questions, and, and my apologies in advance if I don't get to all of them. But um, so, okay. Um, of course, Russia, or now I mean the Russian government, right? Will claim will 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 spin a different tale about you know, Crimean Tatars, and I, you know, I don't need to give it too much credence, but there's a certain, there's a certain logic that flows from it, right? So the, this indigenous law, I think you talked about, um, um, I may have missed it, but can you say a little bit more ab ab about what it claims to be doing for Tatars, for Crimean Tatars? Because um, this is Russian Federation law, if I understand it, right? Uh, no, hmm. so, um, okay. So Russia in Crimea, they don't recognize Crimean Tatars as indigenous people. They uh, are okay. saying, so for them, and I see there is a question about the population number. Yeah. So for, for Russian, there is, uh, I don't remember exactly, but there was like a, a particular number that if you are less than that number, I, it's, um, yeah, I don't really, I don't remember uh, correctly, so I'm not gonna uh, mislead by, but, um, if you are less than that number, which Crimean Tatars are, then you cannot um, you cannot be considered as the indigenous people. In the international law, there is no such uh, clause, so it doesn't matter whether there are five of you or five hundred or five million. Uh, if you uh, and that's why indigenous uh, international law is so uh, beneficial because it's so broad. And it re it's really about uh, whether you yourself identify yourself as indigenous. So there are different criterias, but it's very broad. Uh, 
So as long as you see yourself and your community as indigenous people, then you are indigenous. So you don't really need to, uh, like you need to have uh, self-governing bodies um, uh, or government. That's what Crimean Tatars have. You need to have like a, an actual distinction, have your own uh, like language and culture. Uh, so it's actually very, uh, very broad and, um, and uh, yes, it doesn't require any uh, like, I don't know, uh, genetic like excavations or, or anything like that. And that's why it's so, uh, it was a really, uh, uh, really great that Crimean Tatars just saw themselves in, in uh, good, yeah, fine, uh, carve out space uh, in that uh, legal framework. Yeah, um, I've, uh, you probably saw that Greta Uling mentions 50,000 as the number. I'm, I'm not, I don't have a chance to, to verify that, but that's, but the numbers game is really, um, is really in a way a very strange way to evaluate indigeneity, right? Especially if you think of indigenous groups as having been by different degrees wiped out by colonizers so the numbers game would seem to be the opposite of what you would you know um want in order to establish some notion of ind indigeneity um two two questions kind of related to you know the core of you know how people envision themselves and i realize that this is you know th this is hard stuff i mean having done you know similar research in in different enough kind of contexts um so much depends on who you who you talk to but can is there a sense of a you know a common uh, like our classic text that might anchor the language and therefore identity or if it's not a if it's not a text um are there uh, and this may not be the core of your research but you know maybe it came up um what are the common reference points um does it go to deportation does it go to early soviet period does it go further back and then a related question comes from um, Erkin Momunov um, about Pan-Turkism, right? So, you know, it, obviously, as you know, <laughs> the further back you go, the less the, the sort of um, commonly used ethnic terms make, make sense, right? Because you have, at least in the Turkic world, a lot of mixing, um, a lot of linguistic, cultural, religious mixing, and so on. So, you know, at what point do we see sort of the emergence of a of a Crimean Tatar sort of sense of distinctiveness um, that would separate them from the from others in the Turkic world? Um, or I guess, you know, one other way to think about this is what are the connections to this day? Like, you know, in, in your research, did you come up with um, some common patterns through which people viewed how they're located vis-a-vis -vis the Turkic world, not just Turkey, but also, you know, Turkic world across Central Asia. Right. So I'll start with the reference points. Yes, uh, as in uh, any modern nation, there are the foundational texts and then there are uh, national heroes and national myths and um, um, all of that. Uh, for Crimean Tatars, the father of the Crimean Tatar language is uh, Ismail Gaspirali or Ismail Gasprinsky in the Russian equivalent. Uh, he was the 19th century educator and uh, modernizer. He, uh, he started this new method school that was uh, you know, in Central Asia, among other um, Turkish group or Muslim groups. Um, that uh, new method school that was uh, su supposed to secularize education and uh, make it more um, kind of European uh, to have secular subjects and not just Quran as it was before, not just Arabic language. Um, so he, ha he has been a prolific author and, and also a journalist. He had a um, newspaper Terjiman uh, or the translator um, that was I, I, I think it was the long lasting uh, uh, really the newspaper la la lasting the longest uh, and um, today all Crimean Tatars uh, think that he was the father of the Crimean Tatar language and uh, also nation and then there are other um, such heroes as Naman Shilibi Jihan, 
uh, and um, uh, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name is the um, see the meat. Ah, oh, forgetting. I'm sorry, but uh, one of the most prominent is Naman Shadi Bidehan, and um, he was the uh, chief mufti and the main uh, kind of national leader in the 1917. Uh, he was um, the leader of the first Kurultai in 1917 and then declaring the uh, Crimean Democratic Republic. Um, and then he was executed very violently by the Bolsheviks, and that also made him this martyr in the Crimean Tatar <clears throat> discourse, uh, anti Soviet discourse. Um, yeah, so I, I guess those were the main. And then about the pan, uh, pan Turkish identity. So uh, Ismail Gasprinsky in the nineteen um, in the nineteenth century was actually the proponent of the pan Turkish ideas, and uh, his main goal was um, to unite all uh, kind of Turkish Muslim brothers in the Russian Empire under one um, common language, common culture. Uh, make, uh, he saw the strength in unity, but that didn't really take took hold. And then the next generation of Crimean Tatar, like revolutionary nationalists, they uh, really didn't buy this idea. And um, uh, and now I honestly, I don't know. I've never I never imagined that in my in my field work. I actually think that the is this. Um, um, particularistic Crimean Tatar identity is very strong and they actually draw a, like a real distinction between them and, and Turkish, Tur Turks. Um, they do see Turkey as this, I don't know, second homeland or something like, uh, like a, um, uh, more like a brotherhood, more like, um, cultural, um, brotherhood, yes, uh, but they definitely see themselves as being very different. I have not encountered the pan-Turkish ideas, at least not in my, not in 2019 <laughs> when I was doing my research. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, like, I imagine that the, the, um, the potential at least for this war to change, well, of course, a whole series of things, but particularly for Crimean Tatars, um, it would seem significant, and I, and I guess one possibility is, un, as if it needed to, as if it needed to be underscored more, the just fundamental um, fragility of uh, Crimean Tatar sort of existence, and so it leads to the possibility, um, at, at least, of thinking about kinds of, you know, connectedness in a different way. Um, so not predicting that there's going to be some, you know, radical rise of, of pan-Turkic um, sort of sentiment, but but potentially. And there's one comment in in the um, in the Q and A uh, about how you know Central Asians are starting to imagine themselves as you know having some kind of uh, solidarity that might um, buffer them against Russian or or in Central Asian's case Chinese encroachments. Whether or not that would be effective is a separate kind of conversation, but I do think it 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 restructures the you know the horizons of what's possible, and you know at this moment anything is possible. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, definitely. But I actually think that there's more chances of Crimean Tatars aligning that with Ukrainians, which they do now. That's what we see. Crimean Tatars actually see themselves as uh, part of the Ukrainian political nation. And a lot of Crimean Tatars are fighting and have been fighting since 2014 in Donbass. And um, I, yes, I don't really see uh, see the direction that, I mean, Turkey and Erdogan particularly have been like big allies for Crimean Tatars and ha they have been, um, yeah, sponsoring mosques and since the 90s and now helping the Crimean Tatar leadership um, in Kyiv. So there's definitely a very strong uh, solidarity and alliance. Um, but I think if we look at like politically and uh, uniting um, 
to protect yourself against the bigger enemy. I think that's uh, what Crimean Tatars are doing with Ukrainians. Yeah, it makes sense. And and if um, and there's a there's a question. Actually, there are two questions sort of on that. Um, well, one is specifically on the on the Turkish connection. Um, what's your sense? And, and again, this is probably beyond your research, but if you could speculate, do, is it your sense that Crimean Tatars in today's Turkey have retained identity and language? Um, that's the that's the first question. And then the second question uh, actually is uh, is is in a way. This is from Pavlo Bosi. Um, do you think that after Crimea returns to Ukraine, I love the start of this question. Do you think that after Crimea returns to Ukraine, there might be uh, any danger of future separatism if its status gets elevated above the status of other Ukrainian regions? Um, so it sounds like from what you were just saying, the um, Crimean Tatars would feel rather well protected and would like that arrangement. But what um, uh, what what are the possibilities for, for separatism? Um, when Crimea is returned to Ukraine. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. So I guess answering the first question um, about Turkey. So I don't really, I haven't been, uh, I haven't uh, studied uh, Turkish uh, Crimean Tatar diaspora in Turkey. So uh, I don't know that in general, like the percentages and how many, uh, I think that a lot of them have uh, assimilated. Uh, I mean, since the <laughs> uh, 19th century. Um, but uh, but since the diaspora is like really uh, having such a strong connection to the Crimean Tatars in Crimea, so that probably means that some of them um, are, are uh, trying to um, trying to sustain that uh, that link and that identity. But I don't know uh, the numbers, or it's not my uh, my area of expertise. And then about um, returning to Crimea and the danger of separatism, I think Crimean Tatars have been, um, I mean, because the question of self-determination has obviously been very uh, contested and like what it means, what would you see, how would you see the future of Crimea? And they have been, at least in the last eight years, they have been very, very clear that for them, the autonomous uh, uh, status uh, does not uh, only make sense in the context of um, Ukra uh, Ukrainian statehood. So they uh, do see themselves and all the uh, like the rhetoric and uh, um, everything that they are uh, doing in the last uh, eight years have been to show to prove Ukrainians that. We, uh, our self-determination does not go against uh, uh, the national interests of Ukraine or uh, doesn't pose any threat of separatism, that it is, we see themselves as part of Ukraine, uh, but as indigenous people, we would want to have our own, uh, our own uh, territory where we will have our self-governing bodies and our quotas in parliament and all of those things. The, problem with that is is that even if the whole Ukrainian nation, which now is very um, positive towards Crimean Tatars, even if that uh, uh, indeed happens, there are still lots of Russians in Crimea who are very against that idea and have always been and who have very negative um, attitudes to Crimean Tatars. So Yes, there will, and, and now the whole generation um, since 2014, kind of the, not the whole generation, but uh, people who were kids and now they are adults, um, you know, they grew up with this uh, notions of Russian supremacy in Crimea. Um, and that would be very tough indeed. Yeah. Um... I, I do wonder, and I mean, this is certainly beyond your um, your area, but I do wonder what, you know, eight years of actually living in the, in the Russian Federation or under the, you know, in Crimea, if that has changed any minds uh, of, you know, those who were leaning Russia pre-annexation, uh, pre um, because I think that there were a lot of promises made, and it's unclear to me that those promises were kept. But 
Um, but I want to ask about actually sort of the flip side of that. I mean, you mentioned that there's some antagonism towards uh, Crimean Tatars among um, especially ethnic Russians, or at least there, there was. Um, um, what about allies? What about, I mean, are there, uh, surely this is not just a Crimean Tatar issue. Surely there are um, those, well, okay, outside Crimea for sure, right? Because you mentioned the connections to the indigenous movement, and I imagine there are some pretty robust connections. But what about inside Crimea? I mean, to what extent would non-Crimean Tatars sympathize with, um, you know, some kind of um, uh, some kind of notion of a need to protect Tatar land, Tatar language, uh, culture, history, and so on? Yeah. Well, um, again, there is no like real data on that, like percentages, how many support and how many don't. But just from the um, kind of my overall impression is that the relationships between the Russians, uh, and when I say Russian, I, I really mean like Slavic, um, because uh, Ukrainians and, and Russians uh, in Crimea who were resettled there, they really didn't see themselves in those uh, different terms. They were all members of the Russian speaking community. Um, so there were always this distinction between Crimean Tatars and the rest Slavic amalgamation. Um, and so a lot, I heard a lot of stories of how Crimean Tatars were returning and people were really afraid of them. There were all these like stereotypes and, uh, and they really thought that they were some kind of demons uh, that are coming and are going to kill everyone. And, you know, of course, that uh, just like through interaction and everyday interaction, that kind of uh, proved wrong. So a lot of Crimean Tatars and uh, Russians, Ukrainians, they had good relationships like neighbors and um, uh, people studying in college together. Uh, just on a very everyday level, things uh, got better for Crimean, like in terms of the interpersonal relationships. But bef but uh, during the annexation, those old um, those old stereotypes that has been kind of uh, elevated again. And um, uh, Crimean Tatars told me like it was not one a single story. It was a lot of stories like that that. Uh, the Slavic, uh, like Russians, were uh, really very openly saying that they were hoping that the Crimean Tatars will de be deported so that they would could occupy their houses again. And they would mark uh, the houses with like red um, um, color to uh, mark what house I will take. Um, so that, that uh, was uh, real and... Um, Crimean Tatars sometimes are afraid to speak the language in the public transport. Uh, but then there are, of course, uh, so basically now it's not really even an ethnic divide in Crimea. It is the pro-Ukrainian or pro-Russian divide because not all Russians are pro-Russian um, and not all Crimean Tatars are pro-Ukrainian. <laughs> it's a very small, tiny minority, but there are those who went to collaborate with Russians for what they were ostracized from their community uh, and not recognized anymore as, as part of Crimean Tatars. But um, there's definitely, because a lot of uh, people who are either Russians or Ukrainians who are openly pro-Ukrainian, like for example, uh, Alex Sinsov, uh, who is Russian speaking, uh, I think he's Russian, <laughs> who lived in Crimea all his life, uh, he was very pro-Ukrainian. Uh, and of course, he's a big ally of Crimean Tatars. So I think they have been uh, like not an ethnic distinction, but this distinction um, between pro-Russian, pro-Ukrainian, and that's how the alliances are now. And uh, Crimean Tatars have a lot of um, uh, solidarity from the, those pro-Ukrainian minority in Crimea. Um. We're putting you through the ringer. Do you have energy for a last bit of a last couple of questions here? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> You've earned your lunch or whatever comes next. Um, the uh, I guess can you say a little bit about um because we haven't we haven't said much about you know Soviet legacies and that kind of thing. I mean, obviously they're kind of like everywhere um, in Crimea. Whether you're talking about 
um, uh, the the um, nominal uh, change of you know of uh, of territory or whether you're talking about deportation or whatever. But but I'm thinking about you know Soviet in, in sort of people's imagination, right? Um, and one possible way of thinking about the Soviet uh, period is okay, maybe not quite a golden age because we were deported, but you know, depends how you read Soviet history. Maybe maybe that was Stalin's mistake, uh, you know, during war something happened, but then maybe that was the aberration, right? And so maybe the rest of the Soviet experience was was a period when we were we the Crimean Tatars were reasonably well supported. Um, and the question from Brenda is, you know, we were in most enfranchised, right? Do you think that there's any, I mean, did you see in your research any kind of, um, any kind of nostalgia uh, for at least selected elements of, of the Soviet period? And, and, um, and what, would, what would those have been? Yes, thank you. That's a, a really wonderful question. And um, uh, there is no nostalgia whatsoever. There is actually, because, so the Crimean Tatars really had only this like first decade of uh, some uh, development and uh, rights, and then they were deported. And then after that, uh, they were not allowed to resettle to Crimea. So they have been demanding and fighting for 40 years to return back. And the, what Soviet government did is that uh, first, they didn't recognize them as Crimean Tatars. They didn't recognize that Crimea is their homeland. They put them in the same category as just Tatars, and they um, um, they didn't. They were trying to show that Crimean Tatars are enrooted in those places of exile, so they were throwing resources there, and um, yeah, just uh, as I guess with uh, a lot of other. Uh, nations, they were trying to turn them into this obedient uh, Russian proletariat. Um, and so even though Crimean Tatars in those places they have managed in the decades have a pretty good like standard um, um, economic situation, they had houses, they had cars, they could get a good job if it was not related to any Crimean Tatar cause. Uh, but any uh, attempt to try to move back to Crimea, that was, uh, they were deported again and they were, yeah, completely not allowed uh, that. So for them, this myth of Crimea as their homeland was so ingrained and so important. Uh, uh, I think uh, Greta Euling wrote about it in a, a wonderful book about how, um, this uh, romanticization and memory of Crimea really forced people who have uh, were either children or have never even who were born in exile to uh, just um, fight all their life, um, being threatened by KGB, go to prison uh, just to return uh, to that land. So for them, uh, everything is related now to. The Soviet Union is the um, really an oppressor nation that uh, they have been fighting for as long as they can remember themselves. But that's actually interesting because that's the discourse now, very anti-Soviet, very anti-communist. But as I was mentioning just from in the very, very beginning of my presentation, that was not how they framed themselves during the Soviet times. So in all the letters and all the petitions everywhere, they have been um, trying to prove themselves as, this, as the loyal Soviet citizens, that they pose no threat, that they are not collaborators. All these letters about how they were fighting alongside, like together in the Red Army, um, you know, those were to prove that they uh, are not unreliable. Uh, so there is, I, I find it's also very interesting, this distinction between how they have been w consciously or, or not or strategically or however it was, but this is how they were portraying themselves. And it's very, very different because now, from now, now they are very anti-Soviet. Yeah, I mean, when, when you're in the position of having to, uh, to um, constantly uh, plead that you are not a uh, collaborator, then 
I mean, th then things aren't going well, obviously. And and one of the things that I think runs through this story is, I mean, it's it's tragic in so many in so many moments and in so many in so many ways. And and I know the larger project because you've shared it with me, and it's going to be a great dissertation and then a great book. Um, it, you know, is about the sort of you call it the instru instrumentalization of different sort of uh, forms of identity. And today's talk was just one one part of that. And you can see why. A, a group that has fallen victim uh, to these kinds of tragic developments uh, at so many different points would be interested in availing itself of any kind of connection <laughs> that it can make, yes. right? Exactly. Um, indigeneity being uh, one of them. Masha, this is so, uh, so amazing. It's so great to have had the chance finally to sit down with you. I know we're going to see each other in person next week um, before you, uh, before you leave us. Thanks to um, everyone for their, um, their great questions and comments and uh yeah we'll, we'll see you next time thank you so much thank you ed and for everyone for wonderful questions for coming to listen and serious for organizing and for having me thank you oh our pleasure okay everybody thunderous <laughs> applause okay they can only see my hands so thanks again everybody enjoy the rest of the day bye take care